You are invited to sharpen your command and leadership skills at the 2024 Blue Card Hazard Zone Conference. It's coming to the Sharonville Convention Center just outside Cincinnati, Ohio, September 30th through October 4th. It is five full days of command education and training at this year's Hazard Zone Conference. We have 21 instructors, networking opportunities, and this is a place to become a better incident commander. Register now at HazardZoneBC.com. We'll see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the B-Shifter podcast. John Vance here with you today on this special best of episode where we're going to feature not one, not two, but three questions from Ask the Chiefs. Uh, We'll have Terry Garrison and Nick Brunacini here shortly answering a couple of questions. And then in the middle of all that, we'll have our resident ops chief, Josh Bloom in to answer a question for Ask the Ops Chief. So these are taken from past episodes, kind of edited down. Uh, They're ones that are very popular. Hopefully you haven't heard them before, so it'll be new to you or a good review and in kind of an edited version of Ask the Chiefs today on the B-Shifter podcast. Let's see, today is August 26th. We're winding down with summer. That means here at B-Shifter and Blue Card, We are really in full gear planning for the 2024 Hazard Zone Conference. There are still seats available for that. Uh, We have about 130, 140 seats left for the general session, October 3rd and 4th at the Sharonville Convention Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. I do believe we had three people back out of the May Day workshop as well. So that means we have a couple of May Day spots uh, open. So the biggest gathering for anybody ever addressing May Days is at this year's May Day workshop. So if you uh, have uh, time to get in on that, please go to hazardzonebc.com and get registered for the 2024 Blue Card Hazard Zone Conference, the largest gathering of incident commanders in the country brought to you by blue card and b shifter we can't wait to see you this fall in sharonville ohio so the other thing i wanted to get to we appreciate everyone that that listens that watches that subscribes to the b shifter podcast we got back from fri a couple weeks ago in dallas a lot of positive uh comments Also, some constructive comments and some suggestions. We always appreciate that. But if you could do me a favor, just tell a friend. Uh, Word of mouth is the best way to grow this podcast. And and we certainly appreciate the uh, thousands of subscribers that have made this a success here now for the last two and a half years. But we're always looking for more listeners and more people to uh, join the B-Shifter community. So share our podcast. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and feel free to leave a review. Five stars is nice, but whatever you can do, I understand. So let's get into it right now. The best of B-Shifter podcast with Ask the Chiefs. Our first question comes from BW. And BW is asking, how do we maintain our service as a highly motivated paramilitary service as the social pendulum swings so far without offending the new generation? So here, here's somebody working with newer firefighters that, um, you know, the, the paramilitary might not make sense to. So what's the take on the paramilitary setup of the fire service? First of all, those younger generations, we got to fix them. Mm-hmm. What, what generation ever not said, I don't know if I'm saying this right, that the last, that the next generation is so Good. different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the next generation is always saying the one going out or the, the little bit more senior one, they're screwed up. So it's always kind of been out there, right? That whole, and, and when does one generation start and another generation begin? I could never figure that out. Are we in the same generation because we have gray hair? Right. Let's talk about the work itself and then everything else relates to the work. So I think when we start talking about how we're organized and why we're kind of paramilitary, it has to do with the work. I think we start there and have a conversation about that. Right. Yeah. Well, and that, 
just picking up with the work part of it is the yeah. leadership thing we're putting together is uh, the work is the unifying force, and that hasn't changed much. It changes a little bit, but we you know started off protecting the community against fire, and then we added EMS in the 70s, and then hazmat and tech rescue and all the other stuff. So and then the, the customer service element kind of came into it in the 90s. Of, well, it really did because when we picked up EMS is you had people customers instead of like <clears throat> acts of nature customers, which nobody really gave a shit about it. You know, the fire is the fire. It's a, an eternal force of nature. So and in fact, my Alan Brutusini, the guy who wrote all that, said, I did not make any sense of being the fire chief and in control of this organization until there was a customer. Until we hooked it up of what we do for the community and the Mrs. Smith piece of it. He says, right. because before that, we didn't have a customer. As we showed up and we put the fire out, that was the customer. So it was, we were almost like mm -hmm. a, a core or a, a cult that way. So I think when you started delivering a full spectrum of service, that became a bigger deal. But I agree with what you just said about the, the work drives it. So it doesn't matter what generation you are. And if you like this or that, you're doing the work. And this is kind of the way we organize ourselves around the work. And it really, the fire service is a lot like an apprenticeship. Well, th that's what we were raised in. The, one of the problems I think now, not problems, it's just one of the challenges, is today's generation doesn't see themselves working for the same employer their whole life like we right. did. It's you and I worked for the Phoenix Fire Department for 25 to 30 years. That was it for us. And then you went yeah. off to other places, but that was in addition to what you'd already done. Right. I think that's more the model now is, is if you get somebody who goes 20 years in a fire department, it, it, that's saying something. It, it's, it's starting to look more like the cops did during our career, where the average retirement age for the police was 19 years of service, and you didn't get a pension till 20. Right. So I think that becomes part of it. But I think the way that people socially uh, come together, especially, uh, like you say, different generations. So you can have a 60-year-old leader and then a 20-year-old some firefighter coming in, and they have to somehow make sense of the, the age difference. Well, the work is the bridge that does that. Yeah, and if you just look at the paramilitary part, so... My name tag says firefighter. Your name tag says fire captain. Yours says battalion chief over it. It's it's really no different if you just kind of look at it. It's no different than the way McDonald's is. That's an employee. That's a manager. This guy may be a little higher up in the food chain. Or you go to any kind of uh, grocery store or any kind of department store type businesses. They have a paramilitary style, if you want to call it that, Organization, So I think paramilitary sometimes gets used by us like it's uh, somewhat different for us than it is from anybody else. But uh, my wife, she was a banker for years, and then she moved up into the organization, and she had other people working for her, her and she had a boss, and, and it was laid out real similar to the fire department, just a different type of job. That also happens in the fire service because we have a decentralized workforce, mm -hmm. right? So whenever you have a decentralized workforce, you have employees that are not at headquarters. How do you get information to them? How do they get information back to you? A lot of that is done through a communication chain that matches that uh, paramilitary organization. you got to use that communication chain. You know, and I think paramilitary, yeah. you said it, 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 we're not the military. It, it, now we're public safety and it looks a certain way, but we don't, <clears throat> I think the paramilitary piece of it is, it, is that's as much as you're going to join and you're part of this. Right. It, th this is like you're, you're no longer a citizen, is you're part of a different organization that provides service to the community. Nick, you made me think of something. So, you know, when I was in the military years ago, when I was 17 years old, the the um, uniqueness of the military from the rest of the folks I talked to and the rest of the organization I just talked about is that there's no fraternization. What's that word they use? Fraternization mm -hmm. between officers and the enlisted men. You know, they have their own clubs and they go to different parties and mm -hmm. that. And they they are so much higher up for whatever reason. And maybe they have to have that because they're, they're hazard zone in the way they work. 
But for us, you know, we have a single level entry program. I've always liked that about the fire service. And when I, I'm out and I'm talking to people and they say, yeah, I want to be a firefighter. It's like the good news about being a firefighter is you start as a firefighter like the rest of us did. And you can move up in the organization as much as you want to. If you want to stay a firefighter for 20 years, we've known guys that have done that and did a really good job with it. 30 years, right? Mm-hmm. If you want to move to captain or you want to move to chief, but a firefighter can end up being a fire chief if that's what they want to do and they kind of position themselves to do that. Uh, that's not as easy in the military to do that. You know, you got to kind of go, it does happen, but you got to go through different schoolings and then you come out and once again, you can't fraternize with the the people below you, which is different from the fire service. Yeah, and I guess you got the uniform, and but we don't salute all the other stuff. We're not the army. It's, it's we go home at the end of the shift, also. So you know, I don't know. Maybe it's paramilitary because we shop and cook and we can eat together. I mean, there there's there similarities, but it's 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 still occupational mm-hmm. at the end of the day. There's some departments out there though that still line up with the class A uniform hats when the chief comes in and. They are doing like military stuff, standing at attention, and we were we, we were too busy going on calls and being a fire department to do any of that nonsense. Now I got to tell you, when I was in Houston, they did that. I would try to sneak in fire stations. I was there for five years, and three and a half or those years, I I lived without my wife there. She stayed here in the valley, so I had a lot of time in the evenings and on the weekends. I'd stay out of trouble. I'm not a fire buff, but what I would do is on a Saturday or Sunday, I'd go visit a fire station. And I remember one fire station, we've never had a chief here in our entire history of this fire station. We never had that. So I'd walk in there like I'm wearing civilian clothes. And I was like, who's the old guy? And I go on the fire chief. Well, that got out. And then um, <laughs> when I would start to visit, they would they were so respectful, the Houston firefighters. They weren't doing this out of meanness or unkindness, but that was their history. And I couldn't get them to stop it while I was there, but they would call chief in the chief in the station and they would all come down from whatever they were doing. And I'm sure a lot of them were doing really important things, cooking, right? Mm-hmm. And they would come down and they would line up at attention and then I would go down and shake their hand. And every time I did that, I felt I would say, you arrest chairman running for office. I'll be here all day. <laughs> but they were they were being respectful. It was something that they were doing to to. I think make me feel more comfortable. I told him every time, please don't do that, Chief. You're not going to get us to stop doing that. And you go in the station, you sit down, you talk to them. Three of them sneak out and they go out and they wash my car every time. Well, we had a guy tell us this week we're doing our training, and one of the guys came up to me and we were talking about you know uh, I don't know how we got on the subject, but he said that he had actually had a, a chief officer tell him. Uh, and maybe you were the guys were standing there that said, I don't care about you. I only care about you from the neck down. Yeah. You, you heard yeah, that? Yeah, I heard him say that. That was inappropriate. So in other words, I don't care what you think. I don't care how you feel. I don't care nothing about your family. I just want you to do your job. And uh, those kind of leaders hopefully are starting to be, hopefully they're being phased out. And we don't see a lot of that. But that's not leadership. That's that's control. You know, any... any uh, <sighs> A uh, prison guard could could act like that. But I think the paramilitary part is it's it, it, our organization is designed around the rank of the yeah. the people that fill mm-hmm. it out. So you have a fire chief, you have assistant chiefs, you have deputy chiefs, and that's the way you divide it up to manage and operate the fire department, supervision, and then service delivery. So. <clears throat> That's the part that that makes sense to me. So, you know, the, one of the things we would talk about is it's like in blue card is when you're doing like the tactical level is staffed by uh, a variety of individuals across the whole of the fire service. Anywhere from the secretaries from the training academy to assistant chiefs of operations. Middle we'll, manager. We'll, we'll fill in the tactical level at the incident scene. Well, <clears throat> one of the things, especially in like urban fire departments where you have rank, where you have lieutenants and captains and battalion chiefs, well, tactical level bosses in those systems are typically the chiefs because they supervise captains. I mean, so that's kind. So we've arranged Mm -hmm. that to the way the fire department runs because you have so many strategic level officers, tactical level, and then a bunch of task level responders that show up that are supervised by company officers. 
So that lends itself very well to filling out the responsibility positions within an incident org chart at the scene of a, a fire, let's say. No, and, and you said it. So the task level, back to the work, the task level of the people have that direct connection to the customer, mm-hmm. right? That's mm-hmm. that's we Brunacini would tip that upside down and say that's the top level of the organization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And customer is a, is our focus. They're the sun and we shine we they shine on us and we reflect yeah. off them. So the top level, if you want to turn that upside down, if you want somebody who likes to think of it this way, they're the bottom level, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. As long as you treat them nice and they connect the customer and then the supervisor supports them in a very formal kind of way, you know, and a very informal kind of way. And we talk about autocratic and democratic, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you have a supervisor who is who is autocratic around a fire station too much, that's where you get wrong. I got my own plate. I decide what's on TV. I decide what we're going to eat dinner. That's it. A fire station is, should be a democracy mm-hmm. a little bit to the point of mm-hmm. now the fire captain sets the schedule. Based on what his <laughs> boss said, hey, we're going to go training next week or we're going to train this day. In fact, you know, in Glendale, they had it Wednesday was always EMS training. So every day had pretty much some sort of scheduled training. And the, and the captain needs to make sure that they show up to that. But everybody's got their, what do we say, it's um, rank and responsibility, right? 12-hour work cycles and have some aircraft dropping uh, agent on the problem. So you'll be there a week or two. That's where the ops section comes in. You're talking about hundreds of people in the, the, the incident operation now. That, that's what that system was designed for. And then they would walk it back and say, oh, no, 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 it's scalable. It, it, is you don't have to have 138 management positions. You can only have two or three. So we just use the ones we like, ops and this one over here and this one. The, the, it, it, it's confusing unnecessarily. It is, you look at it, you're strategic. The most strategic officers that I worked with during my career in the fire service in a command post, the most efficient number was five. So you got five people in a strategic command post. There was never, in my 29 years, we never used an ops section. I mean, it's because the IC did it. In fact, an ops section goes kind of against the four and five because you start off with the IC, you transfer it from a mobile one to one in a strategic position. The one in a strategic position starts to build a command team of an IC, a support officer, and a senior advisor. Really, the only uh, sections, positions I ever used was logistics and safety in, in the thing because we, I worked for a municipal fire department that had all these resources, and you managed them yourself. You, they didn't have to come from other states and places like that to a big forest fire somewhere. So I, I think Josh is right. Is it's just a confusing thing. It's like the, this option we can use. Well, no. Don't, if you work for a, like an urban fire department, you're never going to use an ops section. It's just it's something that doesn't happen that often. It's more reserved for a NIMS type one or two incident op, a big thing that's going to take weeks into months to handle in hundreds and hundreds of firefighters. John, I think sometimes that they throw that out there because they just don't know what to do with somebody sometimes too. So. You know, in our system, if we made division one, we would just send another person to be the the support officer or really the, to do that safety role, embedded safety piece. So you'd have two people in division one. Or if you had Alpha and Charlie, then you would have two people in Alpha and two people in Charlie. So I, I, I think there's just, you know, a component piece missing with, you know, training or, or what do you really do? And when somebody shows up, they just say, I'm going to make you ops because I don't know what to do with you. I think Nick hit on a little bit with the whole safety thing. Same thing. Somebody shows up, oh, I want to make you safety. And then we know what happens with that over all of our careers, you know, depending on the person that it becomes a freelance position and they just do whatever they want. Or in some cases, they just start embedding or or saying things on the radio that really uh, I don't need to know about. Or if I do need to know about it, even better yet, then I'll just leave you in that sector division and pair you up with somebody and you can just work there and be that support piece for you know, Charlie side or whatever. They had three ring binders in the command van 
for all the sections positions. And what it was is when they could they could take any of these uh, staff deputies and they could plug them into the command post, and then they give them a three ring binder that had a bullet list of the duties of that position. And so, so like it was almost like you had them in order. Okay, the first one I'm going to give you is uh, logistics. That's the first one we're going to use. And then we're going to do whatever comes after that. And then ops would be the last one because that's the last thing we would ever put a section behind. But Josh said it. You're just making work for somebody that showed up to the scene. And you don't need them to do the work. It's We don't, we don't build the incident organization based off our uh, department uh flow chart you base it off the incident needs so if it's a house fire that requires four companies total it doesn't make an ounce of sense to me that you would make an operations section for that it it it, it, it screws it up it doesn't make it any more effective or efficient it slows the whole thing down it creates too much redundancy nobody knows what they're doing so when you run, well, hell, you go through the blue card and run through the cert lab with the SIMS, there's no ops stuff. And, I mean, you're getting, in my whole career, I mean, we would have incidents that would last four or five days sometimes, you know, so that's a long duration thing. We never used an ops person. It's just, it, it, it was something we just never got into the habit of. And I'm not aware of any department that ever has used it the way it was designed to outside of a NIMS one, two, or three incident. That was a very mature explanation of what operations does. Because I believe the last time we were in a class and someone asked about this, you just shrieked at them yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, had, and had to leave and, and, yeah. and, and compose uh-huh. yourself. Yeah, I, I had a seizure <laughs> halfway through my answer. And, and, you know, the guy answered, asking him the question was smarter. Than, I, I think he was a certified uh, civil engineer. And you're like, how big is your department? Well, you know, we normally have like five or six companies on the scene. You're like, no, don't, don't do that. It doesn't make any sense. It's almost like, okay, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to buy a fire truck for EMS calls. Let's make them all crash rigs. No, that, that, that's not what it's for. It's for airplane crashes. It's not for going on EMS calls. I think if those organizations that are doing that or, or having confusion with it, I think if they really said, why are we doing this and sat down and tried to write on a piece of paper? Why do we put ops in place? I, I don't know that they'd come up with an answer. No, they, they'd say because the National Fire Academy said so 10 years ago. That's what we should be doing. Yeah, we should do use an ops section, but we should never use an incident strategy. Like, well, no, you, you, the people that, that like have figured out how to do structural firefighting should have a voice in it. So, I have a question for the chiefs. Meditation slash mindfulness is a hot topic in the first responder community for mental health. What are your thoughts on its effectiveness? Do you use it personally? And in your opinion, are there benefits for improving incident commander performance, not just mental health recovery, but resilience? Meditation and mindfulness. I think that's a good thing. When I retired, uh, I did. I started. I got hooked into yoga for whatever reason very quickly. So uh, me and a, another friend of mine who had retired uh, were discussing, you know, what to do to stay in shape X, Y, and Z. And so, uh, growing up in the fire service and you know, kind of a, the traditional roles that we filled, it was more of like uh, whiskey and football would describe kind of our pastime and activities, Mm -hmm. where it's really, uh, at this point in my life, I I think that's somewhat toxic. You know, it's not good for your brain, either one of those activities. So you should really uh, experience some moderation with that kind of stuff. And what I find is, as far as this question goes, and and, uh, just kind of your own mental health, that worked better for me was uh, yoga and cannabis really were a better way to move forward. And so uh, I think I'm in better health today than I was in 2009 when I retired. I I, I feel better. So, And a lot of that is just kind of, uh, it's your mental outlook is also a big piece of it. 
So between that and, uh, you know, working on that and, and sleeping, getting eight hours of sleep and drinking plenty of fluids, all the silly bullshit we used to tell people on EMS calls, sleep eight hours, drink plenty of fluids, is the best advice we could have given anybody. Right. I mean, it's, it's really kind of the key to life. And so I'm kind of following my advice now. And I, 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 to answer his question, yes. And I think it will make you a better IC because it makes you a better person. You're a little more patient. You're uh, a little more... Uh, I don't know, mature in the way you deal with uh, pressures and issues that come up during the day. It's funny because the way you just described that, and we talked about country music, is that, that is a Hank Williams Jr. song. You Certainly. Know, all my fr- Roddy friends are settled down and mm-hmm. doing more iced tea and cornbread instead of, uh, you know, the hard stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, I think it's absolutely important. And, you know, it's, so for me, it's probably more spiritual. That's just kind of the way I am in my life. But yeah, I I think you have to have a, a if you don't have a quiet place to go to wherever you however you get there, and you hear that noise all the time. And I think that's you know when I watch um, TV nowadays, even if I'm I'm not really watching, I watch something that just. I'm not even paying attention. It's more like background noise. It's right? like the fire stations that we worked in. There was always three TVs, four radios, yeah, like the, 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 b- b- PA's going, and nobody paid any attention to any no, of it. No, yeah. that's where my ears are ringing today. Constantly. Right? The, all that Sometimes weird. they would get bored, and they just go and blow the sirens for the hell of it. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah, <Woo! laughs> Yeah, but... but I think it's awesome that uh, somebody would write this question about the meditation, the mindfulness, because it really is important. Mm-hmm. And we don't think about it. Bruno actually had a lot of questions, a lot of comments about that years ago when he started talking about wellness. Right? Mm-hmm. He wanted that to be included in our wellness program. Where, at the time, you know, being a knucklehead that I was, when I heard wellness, first thing I thought of, oh, I'm going to have to do more push-ups and mm-hmm. you know, increase my bench or uh, box steps or whatever. But he was talking about total wellness. You know, the physical wellness and the mental wellness. So, mm-hmm. yeah, in fact, he brought in people over our career. Some of them were successful, and they connected with firefighters, and some of them weren't successful mm-hmm. didn't connect with firefighters. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, a big piece of it. it is, uh, when we started our careers, <coughs> our idea of mindfulness and fitness were different back then. Right. It, you were more, mm-hmm. it was more built around resilience, and there's nothing that can hurt me, and I can go in and, 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 and battle all these demons and do all this nonsense. I can bench press 400 pounds. Yeah. I can I can do X, Y, and Z. And that's <clears> – <throat> as you start getting older and accumulate more experiences, I, I came to find out, I thought, you know, there's not a lot of difference, like, in a firefighter's capability of doing their job between being able to bench press 250 pounds and 500 pounds. Right. You do about the same thing. So it's, one of them's just, you're just getting stronger to get stronger. <clears throat> in fact, I saw a thing, they were talking about a, a quarterback, the Eagles quarterback, and how much he could squat. Yeah, right. And it was during a football game, and Troy Aikman's commentator, who was the Cowboys, you know, Hall of Fame quarterback, and he's like, why does he do that? <laughs> he's thinking, why? He's a quarterback. And then, like, five plays later, this guy runs through 11 people and scores it. That's why he does it. Yeah. Is, is he, he's, he's collecting brain trauma right now. Right. That, that's what it's happening to him. So I think <clears throat> that's the other thing is when you retire is you kind of think, okay, I'm retired, and now I want to be as healthy as I can as long as I can. So that was the other piece of it. As I retired, I thought, well, I'm not in the greatest shape of the world, so maybe uh, I can work on that. So part of the yoga thing is that's got me into fitness again. And so I think that's part of it is you do a little something physical every day to get your blood going and moving. And I've noticed I feel a lot healthier now because of that. I'm lighter. uh, My joints don't ache as much. I, and I think that adds a little more gratitude to your life when you go to bed at night. So you sleep right. a little better. You think, mm-hmm. no, you know, life, life isn't as bullshit as everybody says it is. Well, you turn the TV on and that's what they're screaming at. You, you think, no, you're, <clears throat> you people don't live in the same zip code I do, evidently. My wife and I, for the first time in probably, I don't know, as long as I can remember, watched the evening news last night. She got home and it's like, 
Well, let's watch the, the evening news, mm -hmm. NBC or CBS. I don't remember who it was. Were you surprised and, that uh, Walter Cronkite was no longer <laughs> entering yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. I love that yeah. guy. Well, William Brinkley are gone. And, this guy. Yeah. And, and we you know. watched it for about the first 10 uh, issue, the first 10 minutes for the, the two shootings, uh, the shooting, the run over, the, uh, the girl in the park that got killed here. And yeah. it's like... I looked at it and I said, man, I'm tapping out on the news. I'm going back to Andy Griffin on the, on the Me TV channel. I can't. It was stressful just watching the news. I look over at the Jeepers. I need to. I could have used some yoga right there. Exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, yeah. You could have watched basketball instead. There's none of that. <laughs> My department, like many others across the country, is dealing with rapid turnover and replacement in the firefighter positions. This is a multifaceted problem that stems from department hopping, job contentment, deficiencies in applications, and shortage in fully certified applicants. However, we are continually hiring new probies, training them just for them to leave or move on or and then be replaced by a new one. This has made a difficult company officer uh, process because I am continually onboarding and training and trying to... Um, uh, trying to figure out the strengths and weaknesses of the new employees. I have prided myself being a servant leader in the past and have been able to uh, find the deficiencies needed uh, to be addressed in the new firefighters, but now that is getting more and more difficult. Are there any suggestions from the chiefs on how to best deal with this turnover and uh, having a competent department and not burning me out in the same process from doing the same thing over and over again? And uh, it's exhausted in Exuma. He was writing this for <clears throat> vacation. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Exhausted. Nice. So uh, <laughs> first thing, uh, Bruno used to say it, and I believe it. In fact, I, when I was in Houston uh, the last couple of days, I talked to the fire chief in College Station, and uh, he's getting Houston firefighters leaving Houston, going to College Station. He couldn't be happier about that. He's getting qualified firefighters. But Bruno used to say it, people don't quit their job, they quit their boss. So, you know, if he has a department, and anybody who has a department where people are leaving, first thing you ought to do is probably do a little bit of a, uh, I don't know if you if an exit interview would work or could maybe people aren't going to be honest, but at least you could ask after they're gone, you know, why did you leave? But, um, you know, you just wonder why people are leaving a department to go to another one. For instance, in uh, the city that I just worked in over here in the west side of town, um, we were getting firefighters from other cities most recently from our largest city. And people were wanting to leave that one. And this younger generation, I, I want to call them that. I don't know what else you call them. But they're loyal to the job of being a firefighter. They're not really tied or connected to the actual city. And we've talked about this before. But why are they leaving your city? So we'll talk about that. And then I think we probably ought to talk about his position as a company officer and what he's doing. Because it sounds like what he's doing is very... Uh, uh, commendable. He's trying to do the best he can do, and he's he's trying to ask how he how he can continue to do that. So there's probably a couple things going on there, but we probably ought to maybe if you don't mind talking about the front end first. What do you think? Yeah. Is are they leaving? You know, so why do people leave? We ought to probably talk about that. So people leave for money, right? People leave for better money sometimes, better opportunities. Sometimes people leave just because their the apartment they they're working in right now is no longer geographically correct for them, for their spouse and their circumstances. People leave sometimes just because it's a shitty department. They're tired of all the negative stuff that has taken place. I think uh, that's what you started with is they leave their boss. Yeah. So, <clears throat> we worked in a place, and, and I had this, uh, well, most of my career, where I knew uh, the limits of where I was working, what I could do and what I couldn't do, because I had seen it with other people. And so they said, well, you know, you, you did this and this. And well, no, 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 no. We don't need to talk about this because Jimmy did eight times worse and nothing happened. So and you knew that because it would only rise to a certain level before an adult would get in and, and like modulate the whole thing and say, no, this is what we're going to do instead. 
So it, it became a very good place to work because of that reason is, is it was about the work we did. And everything that we did inside was somehow had to support that. Well, that made it better, really, because it didn't become about the uh, ego and uh, ID of the ranking bosses who made it worse. Right. Right. So those people see and they existed. They existed in that fire department. And you thought, I work for this guy and he's an asshole and I don't like him. But it doesn't matter because he can't do what he wants to do with us because it's not allowed in the system due to the people that are actually leading it. Well, in other fire departments, the those people didn't exist that modulated things. And so it was just the ego and the will. And if you what do they say with politics today, it's anything for my friends and for my enemies, the law. So that was kind of the way people would run the fire department is, okay. if you're in with me, this is what you get to do. But if you're not part of the group, then this is and what that question sounds a little bit like that. And and you said it earlier is today the the working environment has changed uh, in ways that don't necessarily connect to where we were in our lives. So I have a bunch of. like solutions for that that aren't valid because this is van said it it's changed people go from job to job they quit quicker it's just and unemployment now is as low as it's ever been probably since we've been alive pretty close to it so you can get a job and now people are making more money the lower wages have gone up so people have a lot more options with what they're going to do all right let's do a timeless tactical truth yeah 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 Four of Clubs. Oh, that's my favorite club. The Four of Clubs. The name of the IMS game is helping internal and external humans be safe, successful, and connected with their own empowered control. Well, that might help this guy out a little bit, actually. Your own empowered control. What does that mean? I guess that's self-actualization. So that comes after competence. <clears throat> it's, uh, you become a butterfly. Yeah, you get better at, at what you can control. Mm-hmm. You first you got to recognize what you can't control, right? All those knuckleheads above you, if you <laughs> if you think they're that. What can I control and I'm going to get better at what I do. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get better. If you're going to be an incident commander, be the best incident commander you can be. And the only way you can do that is through training. Yeah. Because you're not, you know, you always talk about experience. Well, eventually you may get the experience, but Training is experience, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the shortcut to it. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's where you learn. See, that's where people learn the the limits and the consequences of things there. So that, that thing where we have to almost die to take a lesson away. Well, you can, during the front end of our career, we had as many fatalities in training burns as regular burns because yeah. we made them just like regular fires. We made them as dangerous as we could. So you thought, well, no, this makes no sense. We're practicing dying in fires now is, is we need to recalculate this and practice being successful. Well, you know, we say safety and everybody thinks, ah, oh, there we go again. And you think, uh-uh, we make, the, we make the scene safer for the victims by eliminating the hazards. Well, yeah. that's what we do for ourselves then, too. So the quicker we eliminate the hazards, well, <clears throat> today's fire attack, offensive fire attack, you can initiate from the outside of the building. So I can knock uh, three quarters of the fire down before I ever get in the building, makes it safer for everybody. Well, you still hear these old knuckleheads, our generation. I don't believe in this. This isn't what I saw during my career. Yeah, well, Captain Salty, you in your pants twice a day. We should probably quit listening to you. So... <clears throat> Give me the divining rod. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. <laughs> Get a smoothboard. Tank to pump, Frank. Tank to pump. <laughs> it's just chaos and mayhem, man. You can't run an airline that way. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. I used to say, they'd say, you know, the safety, safety, blah, blah, blah. I said, nah, nah, nah. You know, if the American Fire Service ran the airlines, it wouldn't be safe to be on the ground even. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> they are going to fall down somewhere. Yeah. Uh-uh. <clears throat> Thank you.
Well, that does it for today's Bee Shifter podcast. We want to thank Josh, Nick, and Terry all for being here today on this best of episode. We'll be back next week with another Bee Shifter podcast. Thanks so much for being here.